Scientific and uh, Human Information Technology Ecosystem Project by the state. So uh, I'm honored to welcome and introduce uh, Professor Sra Henome uh, from the University of Turk in Finland. So <laughs> I uh, am so excited uh, to uh, listen to how more uh, informative uh, inside today. So uh, please uh, give a speech. So uh, give her a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Konnichiwa, mina sama, dozo yoroshiku. It's a great pleasure to be here in Tokyo, in Japan, at NISTEP, and to uh, give a presentation to this distinguished audience. Uh, I thank the organizers at NISTEP for this invitation. Uh, the topic of my lecture or presentation is quite complex. It contains a lot of concepts and uh, topics that I will try to open up and present to you, and I'm willing to hear your feedback and comments later on. I'm talking about uh, foresight methodologies, and uh, not only methodologies, but combined methodologies. That means hybrid methods for exploring, anticipating futures, and not only futures, but very transformational futures. And also I'm discussing the importance of anticipating also black swans, surprises, and also trying to identify pioneers for the future. So thanks for the introduction, and I would like to add that I've been um, acting as professor of future studies in Finland uh, now 10 years at University of Turku. And previously I was working in future research at VTT. Perhaps some of you know about VTT, it's a technical research center of Finland. Uh, more than 20 years I was uh, studying especially technology foresight and innovation processes, and the topics could be like future of cities, future of uh, media, etc. I'm also president of the Finnish Society for Future Studies, and I think in Japan you may also have a Society for Future Studies. And then I would like to mention two very important global foresight networks. One of them is Millennium Project, and the other one is Club of Rome. And I'm a member of those both networks. And also Japan has a Japanese node of the Millennium Project. And we also have uh, some members in the Club of Rome. Uh, especially I would like to mention my first uh, visit to Japan. It was already 32 years ago. In 1985, I was a visiting research fellow at NIRA. National Institute uh, for Research Advancement. It's located in Shinjuku, and my research topics were, one, what is the state of Japanese future studies, and also I was studying the Japanese Information Society, uh, Joho Kashakai. And then I wrote a book, this is only in Finnish, about the Japanese Information Society. I can hand it out to see there is only an abstract in Japanese. But ever since I've been interested uh, in Japan and also the Japanese uh, studies for the future of the country. What is the vision of Japan and how is Japan going to develop this information society concept that was already decades ago very important and impressive. And now I'm staying in Shinsuko in the same area, but a lot of changes have happened in these 32 years. Uh, I structured my presentation to you today 
First, I'll start introducing Finland as a futures country, why we are so active and interested in the future. Then I'd like to talk about a special method that I've developed on pioneers. And then I represent the TECAS funded uh, research project called New Carbon Energy. I say a few words about that and the scenarios that we have been developing in that. And then some application of this pioneer analysis and also how we are going to test scenarios by anticipating black swans, sudden events and surprises. So Finland uh, is very actively uh, interested in future. Why is that? Uh, Finland is a very small country by population, only five and a half million. Uh, as compared to Japan. Geographically, we are almost the same. The land area is the same, but population-wise, we are totally different. But perhaps uh, because we are a small population by number, we have had to struggle in order to survive between very big, powerful neighboring countries. That's one thing. And also, a Finnish characteristic is that we are not giving up. We are very perseverance-oriented uh, people. We want to go ahead and survive. So Finland can be uh, characterized as a futures country. Uh, and especially this year is important because we are celebrating our 100th anniversary of independence this year. And in Finland, we have a very low corruption rate. On the other hand, we have a very high rate of freedom of speech. And also Helsinki, the capital of Finland, has been considered to be among the uh, ten most livable cities in the world. And also we are very much uh, focusing on gender equality. So Finland was the first country to give women full political rights in 1906. And also in international comparisons, Finland has been considered the best country in the world for being a mother because of this equality. And also our education system has been ranked quite high. But in my view, Finland's futures orientation or interest rests on three pillars. First of all, education. We invest a lot on education and it means that we invest on people. We want to educate people, responsible citizens, people who can make better futures. That is like the brain of Finland. Next one is technology. We are very <coughs> technologically oriented people, similarly to us do in Japan. In Japan, you are very, uh, very developed in using technology, in uh, uh, developing technology and also approach to technology is uh, optimistic and positive. In Finland that is the same. So we want to have innovations, technological innovations. I consider you know, technological innovations or innovations in general as the muscle of the country. And the third, last but not least, nature. When we are looking to future, we take nature and environment into consideration very seriously. Quality of the environment is equal to quality of life. So it represents the heart and soul of our country. So these three pillars are making the future. And also uh, in Finland, uh, the land area is large uh, and we have almost 200,000 lakes. So a lot of land area is covered by islands and lakes. But we have, even though a small country by population, we have many, many innovations. For example, did you know that text messages were invented in Finland? And also open source system Linux was innovated in Finland by uh, also some other innovations come from Finland. And uh, we have new industries like gaming industry, Rovio, Angry Birds. Did you know that Angry Birds come from Finland? So, 
When I said that I'd like to introduce this pioneer analysis to you. Who are pioneers? What are pioneers? Pioneers are people or organizations, companies, countries that make the future. I'd like to raise uh, the photo of Professor Penti Malanska. Uh, he died five years ago, but he was the pioneer of the Finnish future studies. We have also some very important organizations that became very early interested in future studies. Academy of Finland uh, started in 1980s a project uh, organizing the Finnish future <coughs> studies. Uh, Professor Penti Malaska was the founding father of the Finnish Society for Future Studies, which has now 700 members. And I come from Finland Future Research Center. He also established that center in 1992. Then in Parliament, we have a committee for the future. In Prime Minister's office, we have foresight units. And also for NISTE, TEGES is important uh, organization from Finland Technology Innovation Fund. And also CITRA and other organizations are interested in future studies. We have, at the national level, we have the so-called foresight network that is doing foresight processes. And I mentioned that the government of Finland has a foresight unit in prime minister's office. And each uh, electoral period, prime minister's office is making a so-called government foresight report it is then submitted to the parliament and committee for the future, which is a permanent body in the parliament, uh, thinking about the future, is then evaluating this report. But let me mention that future studies, future research, can also be a, a really a discipline, academic discipline, as its own. It has been a long road, but now, future research is a discipline. It has its own department inside University of Finland. And we have uh, both international master's program and also doctoral program in future studies. And currently, I, I think I have at least one Japanese student in our international master's program, which is for two years, and the doctoral program is for four years. And future research is the large systematic, holistic, multidisciplinary, and critical long-term analysis of future topics and alternative developments. Then inside <coughs> future research, we have this new development or area, which is called foresight. And this is, uh, can be defined as structured, participatory debate about the future of complex issues. And especially governments, organizations, and companies are interested in this foresight. The topic can be anything, future of cities, future of energy, future of business. But also <coughs> at the country level, you can think about, you can make foresight. What is the future of Finland that we are doing in our national foresight process and network? And you can also or pro uh, more probably you have many plans and research going on. What is the future of Japan? And from the point of view of future studies, it is important to open up several alternatives. Perhaps you can have three or even more alternatives for the future of Japan. And future of uh, companies working in Japan, future of citizens living in Japan, that's a very relevant question. And of course, the time horizon can run further than 2050. <coughs> also, next summer in Turku, in Finland, we are going to organize an international conference where we will be having a distinguished keynote speech from your uh, vice director. It's very good. And you are also, everybody <coughs> invited, uh, perhaps the postcard Postcards there can be handed out. Yes, that one. The pioneer analysis that I mentioned. 
Why to study pioneers? Who are pioneers? They are, in general uh, language or daily life, they are considered persons who are among the first to explore or settle a new country or area. Or pioneers are those who develop or are the first to use or apply new method, knowledge or activity. Then, uh, important question to study about pioneers, what are they like? What are their main characteristics? And also, what motivates pioneers? And also, what is the relation of pioneers to the concept of weak signals and transformative futures? In future studies, we study weak signals which are signs of emerging issues. And this is one method that can be handed out about a methodological book forthcoming uh, this summer. It's one chapter, so uh, it will be published in English as well. We are living in a complex world of rapid change. Everybody is feeling it. Governments, organizations, companies, individual citizens. And there are mega trends that are very much interconnected. Digitalization, globalization, environmental and economic challenges, uneven distribution of wealth and geopolitical crises. We have to study the mega trends, but in addition, more emphasis should be paid on systematic identification of weak signals in order to know what things are emerging in society. And this is the analogy to weak signals. I claim that pioneers can be considered as agents of future creation. Pioneers are very consciously building activities on the goals they see meaningful. They are always very determined and bold actors. They can be individual people, individuals, they can be organizations, they can be communities, or even whole countries can be pioneers. Uh, pioneers create new social practices and demand for new products in the market. And as I mentioned that whole countries can be pioneers in this book, uh, <coughs> sorry, in this article, I have written on the method of pioneer analysis. I'm using Japan as an example of a pioneer country in this concept of information society. So, pioneers on one hand and weak signals on the other hand. If we can identify them, then we know or we can anticipate which ways are emerging in the future. And this innovation curve is familiar to you about the adoption rate on, of some product or service in the market. But I have placed these pioneers. The role of pioneers is located, of course, mainly innovators are pioneers. Early adopters are also pioneers. But I claim that also early majority uh, our pioneers can be profiting from pioneering activities. And this applies to companies as well. So, about the project, Near Carbon Energy Project and its transformative scenarios. This Near Carbon Energy Project is funded by TECES, uh, Technology Innovation Fund in Finland, for four years, and it is run, coordinated by VTT, Technical Research Center of Finland, where Pasi Vainikka is the coordinator. Then we have a German solar economy professor, Christian Bayer, at La Peranta University of Technology, as our uh, main researcher at Flute, and he claims that we have to study how to reach a 100% renewable energy system. And then I'm running our foresight part at Finland Futures Research Center. And here I have as experts cooperating from the Millennium Project and from the Club of Rome. What is this near carbon energy? What does it mean? 
It means that we uh, have a new relation to carbon. Of course, due to climate change, we have to tackle the question how to reduce emissions, how to reduce CO2 gas. So here in this project, uh, we capture, it is uh, not the capture and storage system, but it's a different technical system. In this near carbon system, energy is produced by solar and wind technologies, and it is stored in synthetic methane. And here in this project, carbon is needed. Carbon can be taken from the air or from uh, factories directly to this electrolysis process. And here, not only energy production, but the whole society will be affected. Possible socio-economic consequences and prerequisites of the near carbon energy system are anticipated in this project. The future energy system and landscape is affected by changes in socio-cultural aspects such as value systems and people's lifestyles. Uh, the way companies work, they have to take into consideration how lifestyles can change among the consumers. In the near carbon world, where carbon is taken into use in a new way, everything is produced emissions free with solar, wind and other renewables. And this means a radical transformation of society. Synthetic products will replace oil. And uh, they are generated by the electricity from renewables. And in the 20th century, energy system infrastructure was very much highly centralized. Whereas in the 21st century, decentralization is going to be uh, the dominating feature. We are also moving to a so-called peer-to-peer society. It means that on a peer level, ideas can be shared and decision-making has to take into consideration uh, ideas from employees, to a much larger scale. And in this context, I'm applying the Futures Triangle, which is developed by one of my colleagues, Sohalina Yatola. He emphasizes when we are thinking about the future, future of Japan, you can think about what is the weight of history in this Futures Triangle. Another point is push of the present, and the third very important point is pull of the future. What pulls Japan to the future? And I have applied this futures triangle to this near carbon energy project so that I see that globally fossil era represents the weight of the history. Climate change and the challenges it poses represent push of the present. And what is then pull of the future? I have uh, characterized it as empowered, emissions-free world. So all of three corners of the future triangle are important. You should not study only one corner, but all these three corners. And the first hybrid method I want to present to you is a combination of this horizon weak signals, and then uh, making scenarios, and not only scenarios, but transformative scenarios. My colleague, Jim Dater from Hawaii University, has proposed that all the scenarios are uh, one of the four classes. Growth scenarios, collapse scenarios, discipline scenarios, or transformation scenarios. And I have used uh, this transformation scenario category for all the four scenarios we have made in this project. So this is very exceptional and experimental. So all the four scenarios we made, they are transformative of their <coughs> nature. And why? That is why we wanted to avoid very traditional scenarios. So that's why we made them. We started by 
uh, scanning the weak signals, and we identified the weak signals, and actually we clustered them into two big groups, and these uh, groups, peer-to-peer -peer society and environmental values, then were used as axes for the scenarios. And the scenarios are called first radical startups. It is a world where society is organized around startups, which are not just seeking for economic profit, but are thinking about social and cultural values as well. The second scenario is called value-driven techemots, and it is a world where large technology companies, they have become states within states. They have become so powerful, but at the same time, they allow and nurture this kind of peer-to-peer -peer ethos inside their premises. The third scenario is called green do-it-yourself engineers. It is a society where citizens have organized themselves as very local and very self-sufficient communities in order to survive in a case ecological collapses happen. And the fourth scenario is called new consciousness. It is the most radical of these four scenarios. And it is a world where shared identities replace individualism. People are going to feel that they are really part of a collective mind or consciousness. And robotization and artificial intelligence have enabled so-called meaning society. It means that companies uh, create and uh, provide products and services which allow people, which allow consumers to find meanings in their life and self-actualize themselves, which is uh, uh, one of the basic needs of human beings, but in a uh, topmost hierarchy. This is the framework for these four transformational society, uh, scenarios, and you see that here is one axis, ecological awareness, and the other axis is peer-to-peer axis in order to make them different from each other. But the hybrid number one methodologically is application of pioneer analysis. We used these four scenarios in order to study can we identify pioneers in different countries. And the end uh, world or the preferred future was 100% renewable energy society. So the key idea in this survey we made was that futures knowledge can be obtained by identifying these pioneers and learning from them proactively. So Global Insights uh, looking for pioneers was this survey. It was made last summer in order to identify pioneers around the world in different countries. And Millennium Project and Club of Rome and some other experts uh, were invited to participate in this project. And we asked which of these four scenarios, which are possible, which are probable, and which are preferable scenarios. And sample questions were like, for the first scenario, for the radical startup scenario, we asked, what would need to change in your country for radical startups to flourish? And for the techemots, the large the company scenario, we asked, what would make the large companies in your country develop products and services based on uh, renewable energy? And the third one, green do-it-yourself engineer scenario, we presented the scenario and we asked how could society support do-it-yourself engineers. They don't have to be engineers by education, but engineers might be citizens. And the last one, the new consciousness scenario we asked, what local issues drive this kind of new consciousness in your country? Can you find any pioneers for this scenario? And I can hand out the report. It 
is also available online, and I will give you all the references, but if you want to have a look at it already. So the uh, survey was conducted last summer, and the link was open a very short time. It was even a holiday time. Uh, we had actually 160 experts addressed, and 39 answers were uh, received from 13 different countries. Unfortunately, Japan was uh, not one of the case countries, but in the end of my presentation, I'm inviting you to do your feedback and we could continue, like, you could test these ideas, these four scenarios in your country. Can you identify pioneers? And definitely you can, but it would be very interesting and one, one topic for possible cooperation because the results of that survey will be used to modify the global meta-scenarios, these four scenarios in different countries. And the first scenario, radical startup, uh, we asked uh, especially who is radical, and they could identify many technology companies whose products are related to renewable energy or uh, produce materials or biofuels. But it could also be a service, not a company as such, but a radical uh, could be a service which has a new angle, and it could also be a social movement. And what is really, if we say, radical? The radicality can be attached to the technology itself or to the innovation. It can be also, the business model can be very radical, or the impact of the company on society can be radical. And what would make these kind of uh, radical startup companies to flourish? They should have an enabling environment, and of course, action would be needed from government, private investors, customers, and companies themselves. And the role of government was seen as that of an enabler. For example, in Australia, one respondent said that we can identify these kind of companies already exist uh, and they flourish provided they succeed in prototyping and have something worthy of investment. On the other hand, the respondent from Africa said that policies are not changing fast enough. We have innovations, but they are not uh, supportive. Scenario two, this large company, scenario value-oriented, check and not. We asked which companies they could identify as value-driven. Those companies who have business already around renewable energy, but their core business may be somewhere else. And it was uh, amazing that some of the respondents pointed out that Toyota company is a pioneer even though Japan was not included, but of course it's an international company and shows the impact. It could be Hitachi, Sony, you have a huge number of large companies so uh, that could be studied within this scenario, value-driven ticket. Uh, also, people identified traditional energy producers uh, whose core business is non-renewables, but they are moving towards renewables. And also many telecommunications, IT companies were mentioned. But also there was some negative feedback on the values. Uh, sometimes big companies, they are blocking climate change uh, legislation or debate. And the point is that here, uh, the question is how to get large companies on board, shift their cultures to very, very socially responsibly and also ecologically aware activities. Large companies could have very good internal values if the working conditions are good. And also many companies show an interest in the sustainable energy production and renewable energy transition. The question was, for this scenario and for the pioneers, what would make large companies develop products and services based on renewable energy? The role of government was an enabler and seen as essential. But also the role of the public, of the citizens, consumers, was considered important. 
especially important in the case of Tekemak scenario than in the startup scenario. And that's because uh, customer pressure is very high, and if large companies can follow up the customer behavior and their needs and react uh, very rapidly to that, then the company succeeds. Uh, one respondent stated that though being traditional, the company is reinventing itself to take advantage of new technology. A large company can be still a traditional, conventional company, but it can be a value-driven techemot if it's really renewing itself and really taking advantage of new technology and also uh, hearing the needs of the customers. In the case of scenario three, green do-it-yourself engineers, we asked who is a pioneer that is green do-it-yourself person or organization. Many NGOs and think tanks were identified, alternative communities, also some universities, and also companies, and also to total cultures could be characterized as do-it-yourself cultures. And as motivation, green do-it-yourself uh, approach could be seen as mentality, a certain mentality, type of activism, a type of learning process, a statement, it was pure business or pure necessity, or it could be also considered as fun. And how can society support these kind of pioneers as green do-it-yourself engineers? Again, governmental support was, uh, was in demand, and also this kind of creating demand in the society as a whole would be a good platform for green do-it-yourself engineers. Of course, the role of education is here important. In Africa, one respondent pointed out Kariyuki Kiraku as architect, as a pioneer, who believes in creating closed-loop communities that generate their own energy, food, and totally own economic systems. And the last scenario, new consciousness. What drives new consciousness, we ask? Of course, environmental problems create a higher uh, ecological awareness also in politics, in economy, and uh, in diffusion of technology, there are factors that support this kind of scenario. There is also, one respondent said that there is uh, not new consciousness inside, it is too far in the future, but we would need it very fast. We would need also to have existing pioneers for this scenario. And actually, we could identify, or we had respondents who identified pioneers even for this transformational scenario. But the range was very large, from individuals to NGOs, governments, <coughs> movements, even spiritual communities, interest groups. Media has an important role here, and business as, as, a, as an actor. And how can citizens express their lifestyles? through energy solutions, of course, by reducing energy consumption, by consuming green products and services, and by, citizens can also go solar. They can produce their own energy, uh, what they use, and even sell the extra energy. They can be politically active and vote for those representatives that are really making the change happen. And one respondent says that this kind of scenario is needed because uh, he has a sense of being tired of living just to pay bills, being tired of living stressful life, being tired of just functioning and not living. So new consciousness scenario could give meanings and values that go beyond that. So uh, these are the reflections on connecting scenario building and pioneer analysis actors that resemble those described in our four scenarios already exist to some extent in today's society. They can be considered pioneers. And the next step for us is to contextualize the role of pioneers uh, in the study of energy transformations. 
And last, I would like to mention this idea of anticipating platforms and how we can test them for scenarios. Platforms or wild cards or extreme events are, are very highly improbable events which are very hard to anticipate and they have dramatic impacts on almost everything. So the concept of black swans as introduced by Dassin Nicolas Taleb in 2007 is almost the same as the concept of wild cards in future studies already uh, launched decades ago. But the point here is that they can be very dramatic uh, according to Taleb, human history is mostly shaped by such events. And we know a bunch of examples of past uh, black swans, collapse of the Soviet Union, invention of the World Wide Web, uh, terrorist attacks, tsunamis, global financial crisis, and the last one, of course, it used to be Donald Trump candidacy for presidency, but now we know that he was elected, so it can be discussed whether this uh, Donald Trump presidency is a black swan. <laughs> but then, uh, the last, the hybrid number three is combining scenarios and black swans. Analysis, anticipation analysis of black swans to testing the resilience of black swans. And I'm inviting you, if any of you is interested and is uh, going to Nordic countries, next May, 17th, 17th of May, I'm conducting futures, a futures clinic. And the main idea in this futures clinic is to test resilience of these scenarios by anticipating black swans. Keynote speaker is Dr. Karl Hans Steinler from the Millennium Project from Germany, and we have a commentary uh, from Professor Jano Limne, who is Professor of Cybersecurity. And this is the matrix I just developed. We are going to do, you remember those four transformational scenarios, and then the participants <coughs> in the Futures Clinic, they will anticipate different platforms. And then they will run a test. Each black swan is tested against each of these scenarios, and we will be uh, giving also quantitative evaluations like minus and plus in a certain scale, but also verbally describing. So this is a very interesting test we are going to do by developing black swan analysis, and not only analysis, but black swans cross-impact analysis. And to uh, conclude, the discussion I have to ask you, is the analogy of pioneers and weak signals pointing the way to possible futures <coughs> valid, and how to identify pioneers? Would you be interested in identifying pioneers in Japan for these uh, four scenarios? And can analysis of pioneers help us to understand how the future evolves? And how to be prepared for these surprises for uh, coming black swans? And last but not least, in which Japan wants to be a pioneer in this 21st century? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Helene. So, uh, your speech made your uh, deep impression was. So, uh, could, uh, Professor Mashina, uh, could you uh, give us some comment, including the language? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very interesting presentation of the foresight activity and the research. Uh, yeah, just uh, last month, <laughs> I met her at the uh, Helsinki Finland. That's the first time for me uh, to, to visit the foresight activity of, uh, overseas. And then I found uh, she is uh, uh, just uh, 
it's just a pioneer of <laughs> uh, yeah, discipline uh, that I'm very interested in that, uh, those kind of uh, activities. Thank you very much. And my question, uh, I have uh, two questions. Uh, in, in Japan, uh, the education system is uh, somehow divided into two parts uh, from the very early stage of education to the uh, 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 practical businesses. The one is uh, liberal, uh, liberal study and the other is the uh, pure science study. <laughs> uh, in those uh, 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 separation exist in the European uh, society. It is not, not in my well, first uh, very fundamental question because uh, those uh, separation is affected by uh, all of the uh, uh, government activity or the company activity. And for instance, the, today uh, Japanese uh, large company CEO, uh, their several CEOs are <laughs> very, very interesting. Uh, uh, a very famous CEO, but uh, we always uh, very concerned about the background of each CEO. <laughs> uh, who is the, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, accounting <laughs> guy, <laughs> who is the engineer guy, who is the scientist guy. Those kind of the background concern is uh, one of the very important uh, elements uh, to identify uh, each strategy. Of the company, of each company going on uh, for the uh, certain uh, trajectory. Uh, the same uh, incident uh, is in occurring uh, in the uh, governmental, uh, yeah, technology and the research uh, activity. For instance, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> I, I, today I invited one guy who is the uh, director of the weekend. Weekend is uh, um, one of the uh, most uh, massive <laughs> research institute in Japan. Uh, he is now thinking about the uh, innovation design designer in the weekend uh, organization. But the weekend is basically the uh, institute of pure science. And then some people say uh, we can should concentrate only on the pure science, uh, excluding the uh, social science. Uh, foresight is a very connecting point of the social science and the pure science. Uh, then there are some uh, very serious uh, yeah, conflict between them. Uh, and this is the one, my, my first question. Okay. The second question is a uh, uh, very interesting concept of Black Swan. <laughs> Uh, Black Swan is, uh, from, from one view, Black Swan uh, is suddenly uh, occur <laughs> in our society. However, uh, from another view, uh, some people have receiving the, uh, the weak signal uh, very continuously from those kind of Black Swan <laughs> then, uh, anticipate uh, the emergence of that uh, very sudden change. Uh, for instance, the, uh, Trump. Uh, is a kind of uh, a symbol of uh, neoliberalism. <laughs> and then uh, and we can receive uh, tons of uh, weak signals of the neo uh, emergence of neoliberalism. Uh, uh, from this view, uh, Trump is the one uh, very typical symbol uh, or one uh, a tiny incident. Uh, however, uh, the uh, Black Swan works as a sudden uh, to trigger of a sudden change. It is true, I believe, uh, I, I agree. But the difficult point is how to uh, define uh, what is the black swan, <laughs> or the, how to define the, uh, what is the uh, regular transformative uh, scenarios. This is my second question. Questions, which are very relevant. Uh, uh, first was concerning the education system. Uh, 
the situation is a little bit different in Finland uh, because we are not making such strict separation between pure or hard science and social and uh, social science and humanities. And I think it's a good thing because we are uh, trying to make the education system uh, to be a very egalitarian. Of course, we need scientists, pure scientists, and the thing is that usually they get uh, employment better. But uh, as uh, regards uh, CEOs of big companies or even presidents of the whole republic, the background is not so important because in Finland uh, the level of education is anyway very high. So uh, we have both in government, in companies and in other very important positions. We can have people with a background not only in, in science, but uh, they can be from social science, from humanities even. So that's in a way one factor which makes uh, society very equal. Um, then I would like to say that also, this is related to what Professor said about future studies, which is holistic system and very good feeds to companies and to government work. This idea that we have to take the whole picture into account. And actually, uh, even though we think and feel that uh, economy, technology are the hard drivers of society, if we ignore the role of culture, the role of humanity, then uh, the society is not, fun uh, it may function well, but it may not feel well. So we are recently emphasizing that we should actually, in the education system in Finland, have more like uh, liberal arts, the role of arts even, and physical sports. We are adding those, because it's the whole picture in the education that matters making people um, uh, persons that can develop their full potential. <coughs> so that was my answer to the first question. And the second question is very, very interesting. And uh, about the black swans and the weak signals and the pioneers. Because very often uh, a cluster of weak signals if they are put together, they give, um, they give early warning of a coming black swan. So there are relations. And uh, in foresight, the idea is that we develop foresight as a skill. So it is a skill. Can we become uh, more clever, more skillful in making this horizon scanning and also combining weak signals as clusters. And as you asked that uh, how to define a black swan, the same question applies to weak signal. How to uh, define a weak signal? Because weak signal is a sign of an emerging thing that is still in the marginal. They both are very subjective concepts. A weak signal uh, it can be a weak signal to somebody, but to somebody else it can be already a strong signal. Let me give you an example. In Finland, let's say 10 years ago, in Helsinki, our capital, there were not so many vegan restaurants. We had vegetarian restaurants, but not vegan restaurants. But then people have been uh, becoming very interested in vegan life. Not just vegetarian, but vegan life. And the number of vegan restaurants started to raise. First there was none, then a few, and now there are still more. It is a weak thing now. Uh, it may be a totally weak signal to somebody, but it may be, for a vegan person, it's not a weak signal, so it's a, a strong signal. It's very subjective. The same applies to the concept of black swans. What is a surprise to somebody or some organization or to some company may not be a surprise to some others. 
And let me take this example of uh, collapse of the <coughs> Soviet Union. Mm. Uh, it was considered to be a total surprise to many, many people, many politicians in many countries. But, for example, my uh, professor of history or teacher of history at school, he already had uh, written some articles and anticipated Nobody was paying attention, but there is uh, written documents that they are uh, so-called uh, super forecasters, uh, like uh, this Philip Deplock uses the term super forecasters. People who may not be future researchers, they may be company representatives or uh, some other people, but they have this hunch they can anticipate uh, forthcoming surprises, but it is a subjective uh, concept. And what is my point in this forthcoming futures clinic of anticipating black swans and testing? Actually, we are looking for discontinuities because discontinuities, uh, they are like rivers. Uh, a river takes another turn at some point. Something is not continuing. The development is not continuing. And for companies, this is especially important to know the markets where something, uh, there is a point where the continuity turns into a discontinuity and changes the direction. And our claim is that we will first try to anticipate what kind of discontinuities there are happening in the world and in different countries. And based on those discontinuities, I think there may be a link to finding out black swans. Thank you so much. I'd like to uh, open the floor to the, the audience. Today, uh, we are, uh, the presentation was uh, really uh, informative and stimulating in terms of in terms that uh, she's not only referred to the positive aspects of uh, foresight, such as uh, pioneer analysis or I should say weak, but significant signals in our trade. But also a kind of uh, its dark side, I should say, uh, through the black swan type of analysis or wild card in our trade. Uh, also, it was quite impressive for me, for, for you, that, uh, to know that the whole set process in Finland has been very effectively uh, incorporated in the policy planning process in the government but and also in the political arena, uh, in the parliament, through the special committee for the future. It was a very remarkable thing for us Japanese. Uh, and uh, she's mainly talked about the energy and environment uh, in scenario today. Uh, but uh, through the discussion with the floor, uh, we have been also noticed that the collaboration between the natural science and uh, social science and humanities are very much essential. And also some kind of uh, participatory approach uh, involved with the citizens or stakeholders uh, will be also important. And the uh, final part of the discussions, uh, we talked about uh, possible corporate strategies uh, based upon the possible future or ideal future scenarios. And uh, we nicely uh, has, have been uh, closely communicating with uh, Finnish counterparts such as uh, TECAS or PTT in past years. And through the co close communication with them, uh, we, we have noticed that uh, our two countries, Japan and Finland, have a kind of a common areas of interest or concern such as not only sustainable energy and environment but also healthy uh, aging societies, which was also discussed today. Uh, so uh, actually, we nice it and uh, take us uh, in late 2000. Uh, we have conducted the joint foresight survey between us, just focusing on those two topics, energy and environment, as well as the uh, Asian society. And uh, we have also very uh, significant next step, which will be uh, the coming June. Uh, her university, Turku University, will host the international conference on future studies. And it was very fortunate and honor for us that uh, we have been invited to make some kind of uh, plenary presentations uh, there. 
So I believe that it should be a very good chance to discuss further and also elaborate the possible uh, future cooperation between two countries between Japan and uh, Finland. I think it's, it will be very much valuable in terms that uh, Finland should have a 100th anniversary for independence. So I think, uh, again, thank you very much for uh, our presentation and uh, please give a big applause to her. Thank you.